Okay, so good evening, everyone. We're here for the September Curriculum Committee. And um, I'd like to just uh, point out on the agenda that there is a link for the informational summary from our August meeting. And um, go ahead and move on into our agenda. So if I could ask Ms. Shea to come forward, our first item of business this evening is um, new business. And Ms. Shea will be sharing with everyone um, the Striving Readers Grant. I'd also, um, as she's getting set up, I want to just make one adjustment to the agenda. If you look uh, down under instructional materials, one of the uh, items listed is family literacy with young learners raising a reader. Ms. Shea will talk about that as part of the Striving Readers Grant. So we're really just kind of uh, moving it forward because it goes hand in hand with the Striving Readers Grant. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Oop, you're on the quick. Okay. Hi, Ms. Rand. Okay, good afternoon. Um, as Dr. McComas said, I'm here to share with you about the Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant. Um, so the Striving Readers Grant was actually started as a federal grant. I think this clicker might not be working. Hold on, I'll try again. Oh, now it's working. I think I'm good, thank you. Um, so the Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant is actually a federal grant that came to us through the state. So MSDE was awarded $45 million from the federal government. Um, for the purposes of raising literacy achievement for all students in grades, um, actually birth through grade 12, and, and I'll get back to that in a minute. So as part of that, all of the school districts within Maryland had the ability to apply for some portion of that grant funds. So I'm very excited because Baltimore County was able to secure $1.75 million for the purposes of raising literacy achievement, which is perfect because our superintendent had identified literacy as our priority. So. Um, we were very excited for the opportunity. As part of the Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant, there were several requirements for eligibility. The first was that in order to qualify for the grant, the district had to have a comprehensive literacy plan. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. The second requirement was that anything that you requested as part of the grant had to be what's considered evidence-based strategies, which is a shift that happened under ESSA, under the legislation around the Every Student Succeeds Act. And then the third, the last three bullets really talk about the requirements for the grant about how you would balance that money. So in other words, when you're applying for the grant, the grant had to impact these three different populations, birth to five, K through um, birth to age five, I should say, not grade five, and then grades K through five and grades six through 12. So you could not, for, um, for example, write the entire grant to just serve one level. It had to be distributed according to those ratios. And so with that in mind, the comprehensive literacy plan, um, the state had the same requirement. So in order for them to be able to apply for federal funding, they had to write a state literacy plan as well. And so they wrote their literacy plan around what they called Maryland's Keys to Comprehensive Literacy. So they were building off Francis Scott Key um, as a Marylander. And so in Baltimore County, our district literacy plan aligns to these same five keys. So the first key is instructional leadership. So as those of you who are on the curriculum committee know, I've been coming back pretty much every month to update you on the work we've been doing with our instructional instructional leadership, our principals, our assistant principals, department chairs, and reading specialists around um, leading for literacy and what that means. So that key really is about developing the capacity of our leaders to be able to help raise the literacy achievement for all students. The second key is around strategic professional learning. So the um, Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant specifically talks about building the capacity of our teachers through strategic professional learning. Literacy develops along a continuum for our students, so they really wanted us as districts to focus on how are we developing our teachers' capacities for helping our students to thrive, especially, and I've presented before on the multiple changes in literacy as we've moved to the 21st century and how much more complex that is. The third key is about continuity of standards-based instruction. And what that meant is a portion of the grant should be about really meeting the rigor of the college and career ready standards and making sure that we had alignment from those three age groups. So what are we doing for our youngest children to be able to prepare them for 
elementary school and then for our elementary students transitioning from middle ultimately to high school with the end goal of that college and career readiness in place by grade 12. Key number four is the idea of a comprehensive system of assessments. So as part of our district literacy plan aligned to these same keys, we have outlined what we call our comprehensive system of assessments. And what that means is we have a lot of different types of assessments that help us to really understand and unpack the literacy needs of our students. So most recently at the last board meeting, we were talking about MAP. MAP is one assessment that we use, but it's just one of several different assessments that we use um, to help us diagnose areas of need for our striving readers. So we also have, and thanks to the support of this board, have put in place things like um, our Dibbles testing. We also have park testing. We have curriculum-based assessments. So we have a lot of different uh, system of assessments that really helps us to unpack what our students need to develop those literacies. And then finally, key five is about having tiered instruction and intervention. So again, we've come before the board um, many times in the last several years talking about our responsibility to provide a tiered system of supports. So we know that students develop their literacies at different rates and that students may strive as readers for a variety of reasons. So we have put in place a system of interventions, some of which support structured literacy or decoding. So you've heard us talk about Orton-Gillingham training and um, letters training, but then some of them also need support with comprehension. So some of what you'll hear when I outline what we um, actually are including as a part of our grant is designed to supplement and complement things that we already have in place for literacy. So I talked before about, in addition to the literacy plan, one of the requirements was this idea of evidence-based strategies. So for a really long time, under No Child Left Behind and even in legislation prior to that, the standard that we were held to was called research-based as opposed to evidence-based. And the main change there is that before, we had to be able to show that there, were, there was some correlation to scientific research. So it could be based on research. The change here under the Every Student Succeeds Act is that we must actually have evidence. So those, they can't just be based on the ideas and research, we actually have to have levels of evidence. And so ESSA recognizes four different levels depending on the type of study that was done. So it's no longer um, enough just to say this is based on what we know about instruction. We actually have to be able to prove that there have been studies done to show that either this approach or this program has been proven beneficial. So that's a much higher level um, in terms of the standard of evidence base that has to be a part of any funding. So that was true for this grant, and you'll hear that's true of a lot of other grants moving forward as well. And so to help with that, there are two main sources that um, the state and the LEAs were trained to look to to help us identify what are those evidence-based strategies. And so one is a resource called Evidence for ESSA, um, and the other one, one is through the Institute for Education Science, which is the What Works Clearinghouse. And essentially, these are two places that educators can go to, and we can identify a need that we have, and they will identify either products or programs or approaches that have have actually met the requirements. And when you search in these different clearinghouses, it will tell you what level of evidence that program has, whether it's that strong, um, moderate, or promising. And then the last requirement was that, again, it spanned these three different age groups. The first one is really important because of the distinction I made before. The idea is that 15% of the grant funds had to address students aged birth to five. And so I'm sure you can understand that that presents its own challenge because we don't yet know who they are. <laughs> we usually get them at age five. Um, but this is really designed um, for several reasons. One is because the idea of literacy begins at birth. Literacy is a part of our identity from the time that we're born, and it's really important that we provide intervention for students that are striving as readers as early as possible. Um, and two, so that we can connect through our families and have that parent outreach. And so as a school system, how are we partnering with other community agencies to help support our families? And then again, the last 80%, and you'll notice that does add up to 95, 5% um, is really reserved for sort of the management of the grant, if you will. And so the other 80% um, is divided between elementary and secondary. 
So with all of those requirements in mind, our district literacy team put together a comprehensive proposal. And as I said, we were awarded, originally we were awarded 1.6 million, and I'm happy to say we now have 1.75. They just keep giving us money, which is, <laughs> and we keep saying yes. So for birth to five, and that was the um, other item on the agenda that Dr. McComas mentioned because it will be coming to the board as a contract. Um, the program that was selected is called Raising a Reader. And I have some of the materials I can pass around so you can look at here. The purpose of Raising a Reader is really about developing, practicing, and maintaining home literacy routines. So if you think about the other routines that we teach as parents or that we have in the home, things like um, brushing our teeth, homework routines, getting dressed, those type of routines. This is about establishing from a very young age a home literacy routine that we hope will develop our students into lifelong learners that have reading as a habit. It's also designed to help our parents support that at-home literacy development by giving them the resources and strategies that they need to develop those home literacy routines through read-alouds, through access and opportunity to read rich, diverse texts. And so I'll share with you, <laughs> this is just a little overview. Essentially what happens is that in raising a reader, um, teachers provide workshops to parents to teach um, our youngest children about home literacy routines. We will be using our pre-K families um, as our access point. So our pre-K students are four, and so they fit into this window <laughs> with birth to five. But the idea is about supporting families to develop those literacy routines. Um, our students, now the, the kid-friendly backpack is more of a knapsack with the strings, but you'll see inside here are books. And so what this does is it develops routines every week the children bring home a backpack with new books in it that they read learning these routines. They do bring them back. It becomes a cycle because we're teaching that routine. But I'll let you peek at some of the books. And so again, the idea is that we're teaching students the routine of literacy while also helping to support parents to develop those behaviors. Um, about reading to their children, but also supporting a wide range of diverse texts. So students have book bags each week that are filled with a combination of fiction and nonfiction, representing lots of different genres of reading, um, and also supporting diverse um, backgrounds and populations of students. For elementary students, we heard from a lot of our teachers um, that, as I mentioned before, we have been working consistently in collaboration with the Office of Special Education um, to provide a very wide range of uh, menu, if you will, of resources and supports for our students along a continuum. What we heard from our teachers is that they needed support with pulling it all together. So how do I make instructional decisions to support the needs of my students through um, planning, through selecting of text, but also through explicitly teaching strategies. So over the years, we have made a concerted effort to purchase materials, to provide professional development, but what our teachers have shared with us is that the ongoing challenge is how do I put it all together? And so the elementary portion of the Striving Readers Literacy Grant is about providing text and coaching. So our teams of teachers will actually have coaching within their schools, and we will be training teams of literacy coaches, the reading specialists, to learn strategies to work with teachers about how to explicitly teach comprehension strategies and how to manage all of these different small groups. Um, because it's great that we're able to provide different options and different resources to meet the needs of our diverse readers. It's another skill to support our teachers and how to manage and put all of that together. And so if you remember when we talked about the keys of literacy that were part of the plan, this idea of strategic professional learning aligned to standards is really where this comes in. And then we get to our secondary um, piece. 
You've heard the superintendent talk about our priority for literacy really stemming from um, a need to talk about disciplinary literacy. And I have come before this group many times in the last year to talk about literacy across the disciplines. And we've spent a lot of time with our instructional leadership helping our teachers and our families and our students understand that literacy is different when you're talking about reading like an historian or writing like a scientist and that the skills that our students need to be college and career ready requires us to really deeply develop these literacies across discipline. So for our secondary portion of the grant, we will be addressing disciplinary literacy. So Reading Apprenticeship is a program that has the strongest rating on evidence for ESSA and What Works Clearinghouse. It is an evidence-based teacher professional learning designed to support academic literacy and the idea of social emotional learning by teaching students how to have discourse in the classroom. So the idea of Reading Apprenticeship really speaks to reading very complex text Next that's aligned to that discipline, but also teaching students how to have that productive conversation and engage in those high levels of discourse that will then show up in their writing. So the idea is that across um, schools, they will identify teams of teachers representing multiple disciplines to be trained in having a consistent framework um, for what that should look like across the different content areas. And so moving forward, um, we will continue with our first key year on instructional leadership and we'll be um, training principals each month on um, different aspects of literacy leadership. We hope um, pending board approval, we will be moving forward contracts for both Raising a Reader and Reading Apprenticeship um, throughout this fall um, to be able to begin those initiatives. And then our elementary implementation is um, on target to begin in the winter of 2019. We knew that um, in an elementary world, a lot of the fall time is spent really doing some of those diagnostic assessments to understand where our readers are, and so we wanted to give schools time to really get to know their readers so that then this professional learning around coaching can really help them to support that small group instruction. So that essentially is the Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant. And I am open to any questions that you might have. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I attended um, Franklin Middle School where they were using discourse in the classrooms. Yes. And they were reading this particular book, which I really loved, and I asked to read out loud. So how would applying discourse around the county function in a high school level and in yeah. a middle school level? So the idea of reading apprenticeship is to train teachers for what is the explicit instruction of how um, we need to actually train students to participate in those types of conversations. And this is really where student discourse is really where literacy and climate intersect our superintendent's two priorities. Because in order for students to be able to have those types of conversations, we need to learn how to um, civilly and productively disagree, how to provide evidence in support of our thinking, how to cite evidence in support of our claims, um, whether we're making a scientific claim or a claim based on, in a little while, you're going to hear me talk about DBQ or document-based questions in social studies and history classes. Um, so reading apprenticeship does just that. It provides this framework for teaching teachers how to produce that thinking about their thinking, what we call metacognition, where we teach students to think about what claims and evidence they want to provide, but then we also teach them how to have that kind of a conversation. Um, it's a really important skill set for our democracy and for our citizenship, um, but it's one that sometimes I think is assumed, and this really talks about just as we increase the level of rigor of the text that we want our students to read, we have to arm them with um, structures for how to talk about that complex text in a way that then enables them to write about that text. Was it Full Cicada Moon that you were reading? Yes, <laughs> it's a great book. <laughs> Any other questions for me? Great. All right. Thank you so much. Sure. Oh, I was going to say I don't move. I think I stay here. OK. <laughs> so I think we just need to switch the presentation to um, document-based questioning.
Thank you. I just wanted to, for the benefit of our board members, um, highlight that the items under instructional materials are materials that we're sharing with you, and we'll explain how we use them instructionally. These are items that in, f in upcoming um, board meetings, you will see contracts coming forward. Tonight, you know, our purpose is curriculum, so it's always about how it fits in instructionally. So go ahead, thank you, Ms. Shea, if you'll begin with the DBQ project. Sure. So I'm here on behalf of um, Office of Social Studies as well. Um, and I know those of you who were on the curriculum committee last year will remember the DBQ project, perhaps. Um, DBQ stands for Document-Based Questioning. And so just as a refresher, the DBQ project is um, a disciplinary literacy approach designed to help students um, to read and interpret primary sources. So this is an approach to um, learning about history through inquiry. So students are provided with um, primary source documents, sometimes secondary sources, and they're actually through a series of um, resources, they use these documents to go through an inquiry approach um, and to develop an evidence-based argument. So you can hear how it connects with what we just talked about with reading apprenticeship. Um, so it's helping our students in our um, social studies courses to learn skills such as sourcing, how to identify, um, for example, how do you determine bias or relevance based on um, the perspective or whose viewpoint. So the idea of a diary journal from someone who was at the Boston Massacre is very different than a retelling or a newspaper article and how you use that sourcing to help you understand perspective, to hear potential bias, and then to contextualize or corroborate those evidence-based arguments. The DBQs all include before, during, and after strategies. And so you'll see here that this really, um, again, incorporates this idea of apprenticing our students into what it means to read and think and write and speak like an historian. And so um, they use the documents to hook and engage students and also to build background. Um, but then students during the reading use those sources to help them identify that argument and evidence to support it. And so um, it provides an opportunity for authentic assessment. So students have to evaluate the validity of those sources, think about the multiple perspectives, um, and then they have to ultimately take a position. So um, the, the skill of argumentation is a critical skill for college and career readiness. Um, there's a title of a book in my office called Everything's an Argument. Um, I come from a family of lawyers, so that was always true in my, in my house. Um, but if you think about it, in um, college and careers, we're sort of always um, putting forth our claim, whether it's to make a recommendation to this board in my job, to convince a team of teachers to try and approach. Um, the idea of argumentation is a critical skill that we want our students to develop for college and career readiness. Um, and so then after they take that position, they then have to defend their point of view through evidence that they've identified through that reading and writing and discussion of those primary and secondary source documents. So last year, we had brought forward a contract and with board approval, we're able to purchase DBQ or document-based questions to support each of these courses in our middle and high school. So you can see there's an assortment from American history to world history, as well as what they call mini cues or shorter versions for um, courses in civics, geography, and economics. And so um, as part of our contract, we've done training throughout the spring. So we had training in um, March and May training where we um, first train teachers on the process of using these primary and secondary sources, but then we come back with helping them to support that um, and plan. Um, so I've included in here some of the updates. Last time we were here, we were talking about wanting to do this, and with contract approval, we're able to put this into place. Um, and so while why we're bringing this back for a revision is because, um, and again, this is a, a positive, this has been really well received by our teachers. Um, when we talk about getting feedback from participants, 100% of the respondents um, strongly agreed or agreed that the time spent in professional learning was effective. And I know Dr. McComas, as a former social studies teacher, can attest to the fact that that's not a typical <laughs> reaction sometimes. Um, and so this was something that was really well received because of the authenticity. Um, I have a quote here that um, one of our teachers wrote that said, after day one in August, she was new coming on board and she said, I look forward to the second day of this PD and 
then in parentheses she wrote, I'm not sure I have ever stated that in 25 years. Um, and I thought that was a very genuine response to this really speaks to not only our superintendent's vision around disciplinary but also around the authenticity of those skills in terms of college and career. Um, and so we wanted to come today to provide an update to this committee since we had been here last year really describing what document-based based questioning or DBQ was, um, but also to let you know that we will be bringing forward um, a contract to um, modify the contract for two purposes. One is that um, we want to be able to extend the length of the contract so we can um, provide ongoing support for our teachers through professional learning and also so that we can onboard new teachers that come into our system. Um, that are new to teaching social studies or are new to our um, school system so that they can have an opportunity to participate in that same professional learning. And then the other modification is about increasing the spending authority. Some of our teachers have come to us and asked for permission to buy multiple sets of certain topics. Um, and sometimes it's from a logistical standpoint. The social studies department is now so spread out in the building that it just makes more sense to have multiple sets of the materials. And sometimes it's because they have other units that they want to explore because um, students have identified this idea of independent inquiry as something that they would like to continue to engage in. Um, so the idea of modifying the contract is just to allow for for that to continue um, over the next several years. And that's the update on DBQ. Any questions for me? Yes, sir. You mentioned um, increasing spending authority allow more schools to purchase, purchase additional sets. Is this used in every school or select school? Yes, so when we did the initial purchase, we purchased, I'll go back a couple slides. We purchased, they come in um, binders, if you will, because they are actual primary source documents. Um, so we purchased the sets outlined on the screen for every school by course. So this is because schools either wanna purchase additional sets of what we've purchased um, for them or because they have other, um, the ones that are identified as mini cues are more narrow in scope. So rather than just being American history, they might be about one particular time period and they have expressed an interest in wanting to expand that. Sure. I don't have that in front of me, but I will check that before we come to contracts. Um, I can look it up for each one. While I'm doing that, are there any other questions? I believe this one is not until the October, but this was the last time the curriculum committee was together before then. Mm -hmm. I think this is in October. Mm -hmm. I will certainly get that information about the individual cost of the binders. Any other questions about that one? Okay. All right. Thank you. Moving on to ESOL. <laughs> yes. So our next topic um, is ESOL for immigrant and refugee students, um, also um, more commonly referred to as soccer without borders. And so Ms. Shea and Dr. Wisted and Dr. Sullivan uh, will be um, sharing with you um, what this program is and, and how we utilize it for students. Okay, so I'm just gonna intro and then um, I just wanna share that Dr. Wisted is here because as you'll remember from the superintendent sharing the reorganization, ESOL is moving from academics to academic services. So this is part of our transition plan. <laughs> um, so as of right now, I'm supporting um, Dr. Sullivan and Dr. Wista because some of this work started last year. Um, and you may remember us as recently as our update on summer programs, talking about how Soccer Without Borders was a part of our um, summer programming that we developed together. Um, and so um, Dr. Sullivan's gonna be able to describe what Soccer Without Borders is and talk a little bit about how we've used it up until now and then how we would like to use it moving forward. So um, Soccer Without Borders is an international organization that was developed to support refugee, asylee, and newcomer English learners specifically. Um, and so they do that in a variety of ways, um, but they hire uh, tutors and mentors to provide support as well as coaches for the soccer field. Um, and they do that by um, one, doing English language development. So th 
through tutors and mentors, they will actually do English instruction. They hire certified ESL teachers for that instruction. Um, and they also provide tutor, um, and then they'll also, in, on the soccer field, they'll also do English-infused activities. For academic support, they hire um, tutors who are, um, have background in that content area, and they provide homework help. They also do a lot of work to engage the students in, in preparing for college and college access, because we know that's an issue for a lot of our students. In terms of team building, all of the coaches and mentors are trained in trauma-informed instruction, as well as restorative practices. So at the start of all of the, their um, practices or games, they come together and they do a circle be in the very beginning. That's very language-rich. Language um, uh, they also um, do a lot to build the student's capacity in terms of um, in, in the community, how can they become a part of the community? So they, as the students progress through the program, they're looked to becoming the mentors to the n most newly arrived students as well. Um, and there's a lot of good data on the cultural exchange because they're working with students from all over the world. S sometimes our groups will separate, but this really gives them an opportunity to come together and um, really learn from one another. So in terms of the academic support, Soccer Without Borders um, right now in, this, in the United States is in six locations. And so of the participants who um, have been in consistently in our program, 95% of those students have, gra um, have graduated from high school compared to 58% of English learners nationally. So obviously you can see there's a huge um, advantage to being part of Soccer Without Borders. Um, 92% of those graduates then are enrolled in a two or four year college, and more importantly, 87% have persisted beyond that first year. Um, another study done with the participants showed that students who participated in this program had fewer absences, um, and they really feel more engaged in, the pro in school and had um, more self-efficacy as well. For the socio-emotional support, what we saw were, um, is that 94% 90, of the participants really felt that they had learned a lot culturally and were able to better interact with their peers from different countries and different um, And 93% of the, of the participants said that they really trusted their coach and felt welcomed in that environment. And that's also what we saw when they came to us um, in the summer program. So. Um, for the past two summers, we've been incorporating this program into our summer programming. So two summers ago, it was in the Owings Mills program, and then this past year, we were able to do it at Owings Mills and Parkville. We actually gave the students a choice between Soccer Without Borders and art, um, but again, it was part of a larger day. So they still had the academic component, and then this was an extension, which actually extended their day beyond um, the normal summer school programming. So in summer of 2017, we had about 25 participants at Owings Mills High. Um, this past summer, we had 45 participants total. Out of the, we gave those students an option, um, in part based on feedback from Soccer Without Borders, that most of the kids want to play soccer, but occasionally some of the kids don't. Um, and what we found was when we gave them the choice, 85% of the English learners chose to play soccer as, a play, as opposed to the art program. So moving forward, we're hoping to have a contract with Soccer Without Borders so we can extend our programming even further. We would like to have the soccer programming at more of our high school centers, um, as well as do the full academic year programming, which really incorporates more of those components that I talked about earlier, the tutoring component. And so that would happen at our middle school centers. So it would be an extension of the day. They would come in and they would, do, they would run both the soccer programming and the tutoring program as well. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Are the coaches also teachers from the school? So normally the coaches are not. The, the teachers are usually recruited. So Soccer Without Borders hires them and trains them themselves for the year-long program, but they do try to reach out to the school because they think the continuity of knowing who that teacher is really works well. Um, so the coaches tend to be younger, um, right out of college or still in college. Um, and so they're not usually teachers in the school. 
Okay. And do you know who first developed this program? It, it was developed in Oakland, California. It's a man, I can't think of his name right now, but that's the first location that they had in in the United States. They're now in six cities, I believe, including, um, and they've been working in Baltimore for some time, so this is the first time we've been able to get them to come to Baltimore County. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You, you mentioned um, at the end of your presentation, middle school program, mm -hmm. so can you mm -hmm. So the on? larger, the year-long program, the Soccer Without Borders typically works at the middle school level. So they come in and at the end of the day, it's an extended day, and so they'll start with um, soccer and then they'll, or sometimes they flip it. So they'll do an hour long of tutoring, so they'll, they can do homework help, they have the mentors come in as well, um, and then after that then they'll play soccer. So it's a combination. So currently, they're not using the middle school program. That would be if the contract pa passes, we could extend and, and start that program. So eventually, the mentors and the teachers are well equipped in the lessons, in the uh, academic aspect, as well as the socio-emotional aspect of the students. Yeah, it's really the benefit of this program. It, very few programs are designed specifically for my students, and this program, this organization was started to, to support this student population. And if I'm not mistaken, don't they often hire um, English learners as they get older to come back and work? So then um, students have the ability to have um, a young adult mentor who's actually been through that same process as an English learner. Which also helps with the language component, so they are able to reach more students who speak different languages. Okay, thank you so much. I just wanted to go back to DBQ. <laughs> the binders are $400 each. Um, so the spending, originally we had purchased seven for each high school and five for every middle school based on those categories. So um, that would be the cost of an individual binder. And then there was um, additional um, cost of um, around $30,000 for the two years of PD, the ongoing PD. Thank you. I think I'm finally done, right? I, I think you are. So uh, just again, as we move down our agenda, please recall the Family Literacy with Young Learners Raising a Reader, Ms. Shea, covered as part of the Striving Readers Grant, um, and also that last item, Reading Apprenticeship Academic, academic Literacy, she had also covered. So um, coming forward uh, now is Mr. Imbriali and his team to um, um, present um, Pebble Go is a database resource, and so they're going to share with us what um, this resource is. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here with Amanda Lanza, who is a specialist uh, in the office, and um, she's here because she's the expert on the product. <laughs> so uh, she's definitely somebody who can answer any questions that you might have. Uh, so uh, we're bringing Pebble Go uh, forward uh, for your information. There will be a contract modification that comes forward. Uh, actually, this one is uh, next Tuesday evening. Um, it has no change in the monetary amount associated with it. It is a name change for the company, but we felt like it would be a wonderful opportunity to uh, share with the curriculum committee uh, what this product is, because the name of the company is Capstone Companies, but the product that we purchased from Capstone is Pebble Go. So with that, I'm going to um, have Amanda talk to you a little bit about what the product does and is. If I can get it to click. Did it get turned off? It's off. There we go. As Ryan said, PebbleGo is one of our current databases. It is well used and well Really looking at the opportunity for our kindergarten, first, second, and even third graders to have access to content that is going to be informational and on their level. So with um, Pebble Go, it's really um, beneficial for our students that either can't fully read or are in the process of learning how to read or are struggling with, um, with their reading concepts as well because it, it has multimedia, uh, multimedia tools to support them. It has read aloud features to help them navigate, it has videos to help support their learning. There's always images to go along with it to help support the visual literacy that goes along with the text that's there as well. It has a built-in um, dictionary that's also read aloud, so if there's a word that they're unsure of, they can click on it, hear the word said, and also the definition that goes along with it. 
Um, it allows our youngest readers to really have some opportunity to research topics that are either interesting to them as well as for our teachers to have content that specifically matches our curriculum that's on the reading level of our earliest readers. Baltimore County specifically um, purchases access to four of different pieces inside of PebbleGo. It's going to be the animals, science, biographies, and social studies um, content that's going to be purchased um, for this program. There's articles that are included. There are um, audio. Um, it's really interesting with the animal ones or even with the social studies, a lot of times there's audio that goes along with it of what that might sound like or um, different pieces um, that would help support the students' learning. There's also teacher resources that are aligned to our national standards, um, including lesson plans and also um, extracurricular activities that might support our students as well. It's specifically mentioned in a lot of our slam dunks, which are our short focused research that allows students to really dig deeper into that information literacy process. The next slide actually shows a, an image from Pebble Go. Pebble Go is a very simple format, which is easy for our youngest readers to use. Um, this is a sample article from our social studies database. Across the top, there are different tabs. So all the information is chunked for our students so that they're only seeing what is relevant to them for that specific topic at that point in time. It allows them to navigate by the tabs. Um, and the tabs also help reinforce the um, information literacy process, so that inquiry process. What, where should I start? Where might I want to go next? And ends with related articles. So if they are asked to look at a specific article for um, content-related purposes, it might also show them, here's some other things that maybe you haven't thought about that topic as well. Um, Across the bottom, it has lots of opportunities for not only our students, but also our educators to always print that article. We know that a lot of times it's important to be able to print not only for student preference, but then also to do some of the reading strategies that we talk about um, with our print um, material as well. It has a way that you can automatically cite a source. So as a library media specialist, we know how important it is that we force any opportunity for our students to cite where they receive their information. Um, it has the opportunity to have um, activities to go along with it to help them um, with graphic organizers, to gather their information, to sort it, to collect information. A lot of times those are um, provided as well. Um, and then any media that would go along, either the audio or videos, will be um, available across the bottom as well. So this is already inside of um, our BCPS1 ecosystem, so students are able to access it at any point in time, um, either during the school day or after school for their own personal use as well. It is specifically um, mentioned or listed specific articles in multiple K-3 um, curriculum, English language arts, health, library media, science, and social studies. So if you think back to those four databases that we specifically purchased, you can see how they're reflected in the curriculum. Um, it's really that entry point for our students with research and the informational text. Um, it is going to be an opportunity for students either again to integrate with our curriculum or again um, topics that they're interested in. And they have opportunity to access this at any point in time um, through BCPS1. Alongside all the other things that I've already mentioned, one of the huge benefits with any of our databases is that it's going to be reliable, vetted content that we know is going to be appropriate for our students. In this case, PebbleGo is really appropriate for um, our earliest readers. And if you've had a chance to look at some of our other databases, that's often an area that is lacking. Um, and so our younger students and our um, teachers are also very excited to have this specific database to support their students. So with that, We'll take any questions that you might have uh, about PebbleGo. We've had the product since 2014. When, when you say younger students, what age? It's specifically for kindergarten through third grade. Okay. It is listed in the K-5 section, but specifically for those students. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would just like to uh, add, um, a, and I know we'll be doing a student achievement report in the upcoming uh, meeting on Tuesday. You know, one of the things that we know uh, our standards really require our students to do, and these are um, skills that have to build year after year after year, is for students to conduct, you know, research, to read a variety of resources, pull that information together, and as Ms. Shea spoke earlier, kind of put forward a, a position or a stance or an argument, if you will, and then go, be able to go back and cite specific pieces in the different articles that they read. And while this database is really for our youngest learners, you could see that they can begin learning those process of if I'm, um, and I'll just use a, um, 
an everyday example. If you know they're looking to research um, tigers, right? They can go in and they can research what are the different types of the tigers, where do they live, and begin to draw some conclusions across those different um, pieces of information and resources. They can watch a video on the habitat that tigers live in, um, the different ways they look, and uh, different. Um, I would say uh, food sources they use or whatever the case may be. But it's an example of how even with our early learners, we are able to get them to um, do short focus research um, to build that skill set that we see over time that ultimately they're sitting in those high school AP history classes doing document-based questions for their AP exams. So just so you sort of see how this builds across the continuum. So if there's no more questions. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, so I'm staying. Oh, that's right. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Mr. Imreali uh, is staying. And thank you, uh, Ms. Lanza. I appreciate it. I couldn't remember your last name at first. <laughs> I wanted to just call you by your first name, so forgive me. She was successful because she was very nervous. Yes. And she did a fantastic job. You did job. do a fantastic Roll. job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you. So here joining Mr. Imbriali, we have Mr. Stoll, who's our coordinator for magnet programs, and uh, Ms. Roach, who is our supervisor with our magnet programs. And they're bringing forward to you a little presentation on dental, um, <laughs> a dental assistant pathway uh, as part of our magnet program that we will be uh, bringing forward in uh, future um, contract meetings, requests to purchase equipment to teach students uh, that were, will participate in the dental assistant program. So with that, I'll turn it over to our team. We're actually really excited about this. So I, I, I'm looking forward to sharing this program because this is something new for the school system and it's a direct result of our federal magnet grant. So with that, Corey. So just to give a little perspective to this, we have 32 schools with magnet programs. 16 of them are high school. Across the high schools, we have over 80 program offerings. And we're talking about one of those programs, a, a component of one of those programs this evening. Um, in October of 2017, we received a Magnet Schools Assistance Program grant. It's a five-year grant worth $15 million to develop new programs at six schools. And two of those are high schools, one of them which we're talking about this evening. The grant allowed us to develop whole school health sciences programs at two schools, Golden Ring Middle School, which feeds into Overly High School. Um, so this is creating a college to career pipeline to graduation for our students on the east side of the county. Um, Overly's High School's program will include a new dental assistant pathway um, that Corey is going to tell you more about. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, this is uh, the first dental assistant program that uh, will be offered in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, Overly High School, um, again, uh, will be offering three elective pathways as part of their new magnet program. The dental assistant pathway being one of those three, the other two being physical therapy and biomedical science. Um, this pathway will support, uh, again, a pipeline to college and career readiness by offering uh, potential certification for students that complete the pathway in dental assisting, the national board certification. Um, and this is a CTE completer pathway that will fall under our Office of Career and Technology Education. Um, the third course in the dental assistant pathway will be um, specific to um, dental assisting in grade 11. Uh, we are now targeting the 2021 school year as the first year for this course to be taught. Uh, the 12th grade course will um, consist of a clinical internship experience in dental assisting for um, our students. Um, and again, this is a CTE completer pathway. So to tell you a little bit more about uh, the equipment that um, will be going before the board in the contract, um, this is uh, ADEC simulator equipment. Um, it is an industry standard equipment that professionals in the field of dental assisting use to train. Um, this will support this program. There's, there are no software requirements with uh, the equipment that is going before uh, the board. So um, there are lab stations that will allow students to apply their learning in uh, a replicated clinical setting. 
for dental assisting, they're going to get experience with um, dental delivery, which includes um, the air turbines, electric hand pieces, instruments, lighting that you would see in a dentist office. Can, can you um, hear it? I, I, when I think about it, I can hear it, the sound in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, Patterson Dental is the provider that we are looking to contract to provide this equipment. They provide this equipment um, for CTE completer pathways and dental assisting across the state of Maryland and other counties, again, as well as industry standard um, outside of the public school realm to prepare um, professionals in this field. Um, another thing to mention is that Overly High School will be undergoing uh, a renovation of classrooms during the, this current school year. One of those classrooms will be housing the dental assistant um, pathway. We are proposing that there will be eight simulation stations along with seating for 30 students uh, with sit-to-stand desks. Um, it'll be the, also the first classroom um, within the county to have sit-to-stand student desks um, in every seating area for students in the classroom, which aligns with their wellness initiatives as a whole school magnet in health sciences. Um, each station actually has a simulated mannequin head, as you can see in the um, on the slide, um, and students will learn to perform dental work on those mannequins um, and again there'll be a total of eight simulation stations seven for students and one for the instructor um, the renovation will also include compressed air that will be supplied to each of the stations so the simulation uh, will be uh, aligned with industry standard and what they're going to see in the field um, I think that is and just to be clear this was an RFP process for the equipment. Yes. Um, we're bringing this forward to you all because we thought you really needed to understand the pathway mm -hmm. that, we're, that we're building and why the equipment, um, the industry standard equipment is so necessary for the students who are part of this program uh, to go through the process and um, like Corey said, potentially be board certified, which is really exciting. So we'll take any questions um, that you might have. So once they graduate and they get the certificate, what is this certificate going to allow them to do? So they will be able to use that to go into a, in a, into a um, dental setting and do some of the same work that they were doing that they learned in the high school program. It's much like the CTE certif certification programs of other programs. It's a low level entry level position um, and work that they would be doing, but they can also take that and they can go on to post secondary education and extend that, that learning or go into dentistry or another field that they'd like in the health sciences. So would it be equivalent to, if they want to like a community college, mm -hmm. their program is equivalent to that or going to the community college would be the next step? I would, I would think that going to the community we college. Have, we have an yeah, we have someone from our office of CTE, you can come forward. Um. Oh, no, Sorry. Thank you for coming forward because everything is videoed and streamed and we can hear you for the streaming it better. It be the same as a, as a I know I don't want an 18 year old program. working on my teeth. <laughs> I don't want a 45 year old working well, they on my the teeth. the certification which would prove their skill. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> which would be the same certification at any age. Mm -hmm. They have to be 18 to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to achieve the certification but it, I, I, I understand. All right. <laughs> right. So so keep in mind, these are entry-level jobs, but they are jo entry-level jobs that require right. some training and a legitimate certification that says they know how to perform those functions appropriately and in a safe manner and thoroughly. So, uh, so they, you know, would be those entry-level positions. It's the first level in the is, dental industry, which is also why the twelfth grade course is proposed to be a clinical internship experience for students, so that they're actually applying what they've learned in the eleventh grade course in the field. Mm -hmm. with real dentists. Right. They have to have 400 <laughs> hours in order to complete the certification. That's a lot of hours. So which means you'll have a 17-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> they have to be 18 to achieve the certification, to take the test. <laughs> oh, I don't have a question. I just want to say this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're very excited about the program. I mean, it's... it's um, industry standards, it's credentialing for students. We talk about career readiness. These students are ready to begin a career 
the day they graduate because of this industry uh, credential. And while we certainly hope that they continue their education in their chosen field, this right away gets their foot in the door with a real job right out the gate. So. The gift with purchase. The gift with purchase, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any questions? Huh? How much does this job pay? <laughs> It varies. Um, the beginning salary is about forty thousand. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> not not too bad for an eighteen-year-old. Not too bad for an eighteen-year-old. <laughs> I believe I saw on one of your slides um, that the students completing this program um, received, I think it was, or had the possibility for three certifications. Yes. Is that? Yes. Three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. They would have to pass the exams. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, Ms. Adequoya, do you know? Okay. Okay, thank, thank you, you all. very much. Thank you. And so that really concludes because, uh, again, I know I said it before, but just um, for the record, the Reading Apprenticeship Academic Literacy, Ms. Shea covered as part of the Striving Readers Grant. That was the segment uh, where she was talking about building uh, discourse skills for our students in our secondary um, classrooms. Um, so just to tie uh, everything together. So that really concludes our agenda for this evening. Um, thank you for your time.